So I'm delighted to be here today because I'm actually celebrating my 20th year in this department and at King's College London. So I'm very happy to be, happy to be celebrating that 20th year by having my inaugural. And I'd also like to thank Lynn very much for vacating this chair, which allowed me to take it. So thank you very much. <laughs> But of course, uh, my deepest gratitude goes to the Dunhill Medical Trust, who are represented here this evening, and thank you so much for coming along, who have uh, kindly endowed this chair. So for the first couple of minutes, I'd just like to talk through my, uh, my years as the apprentice, the, the research apprentice, because I think it's those first early research assistant jobs that you learn so much from. So my first research assistant post was with uh, Professor Julie Dockrell at the Institute of Education and GMFA. Uh, we were running a RCT of an HIV prevention intervention. There had been an intervention, cognitive behavioural therapy, six sessions of two hours, but an academic group thought that that was not trialable, so they compressed it to one day and then the mechanism kind of destroyed what we thought would work within CBT. So as a community group, we took it back to a six-session CBT session and what I learned from that many years ago is that as academics and evaluators, we have to evaluate what's theoretically and clinically plausible, not just what's evaluatable. I then had the great pleasure to move up to UCL and to work with Professor Lorraine Scher, where we worked on a project looking at welfare rights in primary care. And we, d we produced a few academic papers and a nice report, which I then think sat and gathered dust on the shelf within the, uh, within the Health Trust Kind of, I think I learned very early on then that commissioners of research don't always have an implementation plan. Then moved on to City University to Professor Susan Gollenbach, where I ran a randomised control trial for Durex, and we had uh, some really important findings which were really, really challenged practice and showed us the best way forward. And the community and health uh, promoters really rebelled against that. And I learned very early on as a naive researcher that the provision of evidence doesn't necessarily lead to change in practice. And I think all of these early lessons really are quite historical now because, of course, academia has moved on so far in 20, 25 years where actually impact and implementation of our research is really key to our design. My other post was with uh, Professor Avram Sher at the Institute for Advanced Legal Studies. I have no legal training at all, but I became his researcher and he would come into my room and say, Richard, I want you to do an evaluation of solicitors' use of legal aid under tolerance, of which I didn't even understand the question. <laughs> and, and he would say to me, Richard, I'd like you to evaluate the success of international trademark training. Didn't understand the question, but we would have this routine whereby he'd ask me to do something, I'd protest, he'd ignore me, and I'd do it anyway. <laughs> so I think I learned quite early that actually with the right team around you, you can tackle the new. And that lesson is a lesson that I really try to play at now with my postdocs, that you can take on the new and you can take on new challenges. So I think those early RA jobs are really, really crucial in skills building. So then, really exciting, 1998 came to study under Irene as my first supervisor under a PhD studentship, looking at a short-term group intervention for informal carers of patients attending a home palliative care service. So I've been working in palliative care and now is able to work full-time academically, working with St Christopher's and the Bloomsbury team. I see Rob George is here, who was the consultant at Bloomsbury, a mixed methods evaluation. And one of the important things that came from that PhD that stuck with me was the theory we generated from that data that actually there's a huge amount of ambivalence amongst family caregivers of people with advanced disease. This idea, this label of a caregiver doesn't really resonate. People are family members, they're partners, they don't identify with this professional level, label of caregiver. There's an enormous opportunity cost of caregiving that people don't want to engage in. People are struggling to cope in the last months of life and actually our interventions need to support that coping and not dismantle it. And also actually as palliative care we talk about patients and families being the uh, recipient of our work but actually families don't see themselves as credible recipients. They think that all attention should be focused on the patient. So a number of uh, things were revealed in this data that have really stayed with me over the last 20 years. So post-PhD, I then took up a fellowship via Columbia University to Washington, D.C., where I was working in the Health Resources and Service Administration through the National AIDS Office at the White House. And this was a very exciting time because it was the beginning of PEPFAR, the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, a $45 billion five-year renewable cycle of funding. And I was right at the very beginning of that, so that was hugely exciting. And we were able to make sure that palliative care was very central within that. 
And this built back in back in uh, back in that time with Columbia University, where we were able to demonstrate that palliative care improves pain and symptom control, anxiety and insight for people with advanced HIV. We were also able to model the evidence and show actually there was poor uh, access and equity for uh, people living with HIV. A lot of work with Lorraine Share up at UCL, showing that symptoms really matter in HIV because they're related to quality of life, adherence to treatment, treatment switching, suicidal ideation, uh, risk taking and viral rebound. So the evidence was building over time. And then most recently, we showed with the uh, University of Brussels that when we look across 14 high and middle income countries, people living with HIV are far less likely to die at home compared to cancer patients. So this has been a theme over a number of years, but I come back to my last slide. The important thing is the impact. What do we do with this? So I'm absolutely delighted that this year the new standards of care for people living with HIV were launched across the UK, and I was invited in, and for the first time there's a whole chapter and set of standards on palliative care for people living with HIV. So I'm absolutely delighted with that. So coming back from DC, uh, I see Olivia Dix is here from the Diana Princess of Wales Memorial Fund, who commissioned me to conduct a systematic review of the evidence for palliative care in sub-Saharan Africa. And the really important conclusion from this paper, which we managed to get into the Lancet, was actually that although there was great innovation and in practice on the ground, there's very little evidence. And we felt that the primary reason for that lack of evidence was the absence of a valid and reliable outcome measure suitable for the African context. So that led to my first major grant, funded by the Big Lottery Fund. So we conducted a systematic review with the support of the Diana Fund. Then with the US government, we conducted a survey nationwide asking providers what mattered. And they said we need to be able to measure outcomes. So that was the green light then to really uh, conduct this research. We worked with multi-professional teams across countries to understand what a measure should look like and how it could be used in practice. Then we developed the African Palliative Care Outcome Scale in eight countries, and then the final validation happened in five sites in Uganda and South Africa. So while we, uh, we promote the use of measures in routine practice, it's really important that clinicians are able to trust the measure that we provide. So all the psychometric work, the years of work that went behind that development is absolutely essential. And I've given you here some examples of the data from the African polls, but also some work we recently published from Thailand on the validity of our outcome measure. Because this is really important. If we're going to be able to convince clinicians to use this in routine practice, they need to know that it reflects what matters to patients and families. It's going to detect real change, and that change is going to be interpretable. And this work has gone so far now. I mean, I'm delighted that the, the palliative care outcome scale family of measures are now being used in over 120 countries around the world, and we have over 10,000 users registered around the world using this. So it's had enormous impact. So in the low literacy setting, we need to think very, very carefully about how people may be able to score their outcomes. And working with Hospice Africa Uganda, who'd been pi pioneering a hand score method, we looked at the validity of a verbal self-report against a hand score, which would go from zero, no pain, up to five, being worst pain, compared to the FACES scale, which some of you might recognise from paediatrics, and compared that to a jerry can, and kind of marking a jerry can for fullness. And we compared that and looked at uh, what might be the most uh, reliable way of measuring pain. And we could see that actually the hand scale had superior, superior ability to predict high pain symptoms compared to the FACES scale and the jerry can. And now that hand scale is, has been rolled out across Africa. But the important thing is what do we hear back from the field? And I think this paper is really important in reflecting on what's happened with outcome measurement in Africa. This paper was led by a group of Africans who came together to talk about outcome measure. We had 72 delegates from 16 countries. And I think this quote is really important. Measuring the quality of care provided was problematic without rigorously validated outcome measures that were suitable for use within the resource-constrained and culturally different African context. And I think this is really, really important feedback. And now it's embedded. So if you look at the African Palliative Care Association guidelines for use of outcome measures, they are being now applied across Africa. The African standards and uh, methods on how to use the measure for routine clinical audit in palliative care. The hospice palliative care standards in southern Africa require you to use the POS if you're going to achieve a five-star hospice status, which is the highest marker of quality. And within the African palliative care standards, 
you have to be using an outcome measure to achieve the stated goals of care. So I think we've come a long way with measures, but that's need, we need to think more broadly than just measures. So we look back at the WHO foundation measures for how to establish a public palliative care service. They talk about drug availability, education and government policy and you need an implementation strategy to underpin that and what I've argued in this paper in Lancet Oncology is that's great but we must be generating primary evidence to inform that drug availability, that government policy and that education and I'll just give you an example now of how we've achieved that if we look particularly at drug availability this was funded by USAID, so uh, US government money through uh, measure evaluation at the University of North Carolina with the African Palliative Care Association. We interviewed the International Narcotics Control Board representative in 12 ministries in Africa, and we also spoke to pharmacies. The ministry identified opioids that we never found available in any facility. And I'll give you some examples. In Ethiopia and Namibia, there was no morphine, there was no codeine, there was no pethidine, and that was contrary to the ministry's belief. We then went on to be commissioned, I think Vicky Sims is here, who worked on that. Um, we went on to do a large public health evaluation, the largest ever commissioned by the US government, and we did a, a review in 120 pharmacies in Kenya and Uganda, and of course stockouts are really important because we need to be measuring stock levels because you don't want breaks in pain management. So we found within these pharmacies a maximum of half drugs available had a stockout level specified. So stockouts are a massive issue. But really important, we talk so much about opioids and step 3 analgesia. In these 120 pharmacies we found that, normally, uh, that nearly a third had no step 1 analgesic, so no paracetamol and only 7% had an opioid, and those were mainly injectable, which is not optimum uh, methods for pain control. So following on from that, I was delighted to win a uh, FP7 award, a coordinating action from the EU, and PRISMA aimed to enhance outcome measurement for advanced cancer patients here in the UK and across Europe with two African partners as well. We had a number of work packages led by uh, leading universities across Europe in palliative care research, so we had an anthropologist looking at cultural differences in end-of-life care across Europe, uh, public preferences and priorities for end-of-life care, clinical research priorities, best practice measures for how to use tools, best practice in symptom measurement, and also a, a strong focus on older people and long-term care settings. So that was a really exciting, this had an enormous amount of outputs and is still now uh, informing successive grants. In fact, we recently got another EU grant which again has built on this focus of measurement. This is interesting data. We did a, a random digit dialing survey of uh, six European countries, interviewed nearly 9,500 people, asking them their preferences for end-of-life care. Now, we had seven European countries. We wanted to run this in Norway as well, but the Ethics Committee told us the only way you can have approval to do this study is if you personally write to every household in Norway that you might be phone dialing. So clearly that wasn't going to happen, so Norway were unable to participate in this. But we can see between 51 to 84 percent of people would prefer to die at home. When with APCA we replicated those methods using street surveys, because you can't do random digit dialing in Africa, when we did street surveys in Kenya and in Namibia, you can see that the uh, preference for home death was lower. And I think this very much reflects the fact that you want to die at home if there are services to support you to die at home. But it's very important. So I have a dual focus on domestic palliative care research and global palliative care research because I think they inform each other very well. And my work's very much not about working with other countries to explain to them how well we've done and how we've got everything right in palliative care because we certainly haven't. We're all learning. So I just wanted to share this study we conducted a few years ago. I got a grant from Guy's and St Thomas's charity looking at palliative care for advanced heart failure patients. So interview the patient, and I say to them, or Lucy Selman, the researcher, said to them, do you feel like the doctors and nurses that you're seeing now you trust, to be honest with you? And the patient says, oh yes, 100%. I mean, they're professional people, aren't they? If you can't put your faith in them, who do you put your faith in? And then we speak to the cardiologist. And the cardiologist says, well, you take them aside, you say, well, this is the situation, you've heard what I've said to him or her directly, but I have to tell you, that was the optimistic slant. For your point of view, I'd have to tell you, I'd be very surprised if they were living in a month or six weeks. And you must not convey that to them, because I've got to have that aspect of hope from the patient. 
So we are still changing clinical cultures here in the UK. It's a really important message. This is not everybody else's problem. It's our problem too. So with Vicky Sims, we uh, got this large uh, public health evaluation and we did a, uh, a cohort study of people living with HIV, nearly 1,500 across 12 sites. And we were looking at their outcomes over time. And we could see using the African palliative care outcome scale what their main concerns were. And we can see that nearly a fifth had severe problems with worry, nearly half severe problems with sharing how they were feeling, and a third severe problems with getting help and advice. So clearly, clearly a massive psychosocial need, in addition to that 10% of people who have severe pain. So it's really important, as we often say in this institute, to not admire the problem, but to find solutions and interventions to solve that problem. So we developed, again, with the Diana Princess of Wales Memorial Fund, a randomised control trial of a brief, low-cost intervention for people living with HIV in Mombasa, in Kenya. Because it's important that we don't propose interventions that people couldn't afford to uh, continue outside of a trial situation. So it was two-week training and, and then ongoing mentorship for existing nurses within the clinic. And we randomised 126 patients to this assessment and monitoring and long-term long -term care planning versus standard care. And we were able to show in this pa paper in Lancet HIV that the top care trial demonstrated improvement in the mental health dimensions of quality of life in psychiatric morbid morbidity and on the African palliative care outcome scale, particularly on the psychosocial items. So then uh, with the family, we moved on a uh, sabbatical to the University of Cape Town, where I took up a visiting professorship in 2010, which was founded, uh, funded by the Open Society Foundations. Did an interesting study there with the uh, Abundant Life Palliative Care Service at uh, Victoria Hospital in Weinberg in the Western Cape, where they introduced a hospital-based palliative care service, which was literally one nurse and a fifth of a doctor who were supporting the wider hospital team to identify palliative care patients and improve their palliative and end-of-life care and make a care plan to get them home. And when we did an observational study comparing the last 28 uh, days of life before and after the introduction of this project, uh, we were able to show that we've reduced the number of admissions, we reduced the mean number of days per admission, we rapidly increased the home death rate and saved admission costs. So that was very exciting. And then, of course, th this is uh, not outcome data, so subsequent to this, we were able to secure Horizon 2020 money for a quality improvement and outcomes-focused add-on study. So I think one of the advantages of having a dual domestic and global programme is that I'm able to learn what we might uh, learn from low-middle-income countries and bring back to the UK. And in fact, I was in a meeting this morning at King's has just... Uh, employed a professor who's focusing specifically on low intensity and low cost technologies and what we can import into the NHS and that professor's about to start and I think that's a really really exciting dimension to our work. So paediatrics is certainly something that I'm learning about from Africa and now we're implementing here in the UK. So the Medical Research Council has uh, identified children and end of life as urgent areas for outcome measurement development. Uh, Lucy Coombs did a, an MSc with us and her systematic review from that MSc identified that there was no valid outcome measure for children and young people at the end of life. And also evidence uh, for symptoms and concerns, uh, even Amisango, PhD student with me, has just published this review showing that actually the evidence that we got is often not self-report from children and young people. Very excitingly, in our collaboration with the African Palliative Care Association, the world's first outcome measure for children has now been developed and validated and will be soon coming to publication. And I'm really excited to have got a European Consolidator Award to take that learning from Africa and conduct a study here in the UK and then spread that across Europe in terms of delivering a valid and reliable outcome measure for children. Now this is incredibly complex, there's huge heterogeneity in these children, they often have additional communication needs, we need to think about what self-report means and what a core outcome measure may look across ages but as well developmental stages, but this is really exciting work and also I'm really pleased that this project is going to be the first time that Great Ormond Street, the Evelina, the Marsden and Kings have come together and these are the four centres of paediatric palliative care, so this is very exciting. Another South North learning for me has been the management of pain. So we know that there's a high burden of pain for people living with HIV and increasingly within the NHS here in the UK there's a focus on self-management. 
really strong focus that we should be uh, implementing self-management interventions. Now, Kennedy and Comer, who's a uh, postdoc nurse here with me from Malawi, ran an RCT in Malawi. It was a face-to-face -face meeting with a nurse, an information leaflet on HIV-related pain, and a two-week follow-up call. Very simple intervention. But he was able to show that he, was, he could achieve his primary outcome, which was pain severity. So I'm absolutely delighted that with UCL, I'm leading an NIHR uh, development grant to work up a programme award to transfer that learning from Africa on self-management to the UK context. This is really, really exciting. And also, Kennedy now has a faculty award working with me to ad adapt that to youth. Another really important area of learning that we're gaining from here in the UK is spiritual well-being. It's a core component of what we talk about in palliative care, but doesn't always receive the same attention clinically and in core outcomes. So, of course, we have the expertise here, building on Irene's original work on the POS and the POS family of measures, and there's also a nice literature on culture and pain. So what we're now sharing with, uh, with our colleagues from Africa and have um, brought back to the UK is how uh, we measure spiritual well-being, what that means to people, how that's easily integrated into routine assessment. And now the at peace item, so the measure of spirituality that we developed in Africa, has now been imported into the UK version of the POS and is forming the, uh, forming the core outcome measures. And we're also, from that, we were able to, supported by the Sir Halley Stewart Trust, have uh, some development meetings here in uh, in the UK with uh, spiritual care leaders and African communities to develop guidelines which I'm delighted to say were endorsed by Archbishop Desmond Tutu so he's been very very supportive of this work as a past fellow of King's. Uh, another area of work that we partnered on in the, in the last few years is uh, the work on LGBT palliative care. So we published a systematic review a few years ago showing that LGBT people may have higher needs for palliative care, but there's very little evidence on that. So Access Care A, and I'm delighted that Marie Curie has supported this work so much in terms of A, research funding, but also policy and dissemination. This work, and the interview is conducted by Catherine Bristow, our new lecturer, interviewed a number of people, LGBT people, with advanced disease and caregivers and bereaved caregivers. And we found some quite striking data, and here's just one. Uh, a man living with his partner, they had two children, he had uh, MND, and he said there was a complete lack of recognition. The consultant, even on the 10th or 20th time of being told I was his partner, still referred to me as his brother. So we still have uh, quite a way to go. And I have to say, I wasn't sure about the impact of this work, but with support, really strong support of Marie Curie and of college, it's had enormous impact. We had 112 news articles on access care. We're on BBC TV and radio. We're asked to speak in the UK and Welsh parliaments. Catherine Bristow has been out training a 1,000 clinicians on this work. We've got a new uh, co-produced community resource with GMFA. And there's a new European task force on this topic. So it's incredibly exciting the way this has really developed. And now, again, with the support of Marie Curie, we have a live study now, and Leah's in the audience working on that from our systematic review of bereavement. We developed this uh, model from the existing literature on how we thought bereavement may work for LGBT people, developed a number of hypotheses, and now with the uh, Marie Curie funding, we're uh, in the midst of a population-based survey with the Office for National Statistics looking at out, uh, bereavement outcomes. Now, this is really important because, if, yes, we can look at LGBT community, but we're also, for the first time, able to really properly measure bereavement outcomes and health service use in the general population. So it's not just LB LGBT people who we are oversampling, but in the general population, because actually the bereavement literature is quite sparse. But here's some initial analysis that uh, Leah has done and showing that people who are bereaved of a same-sex partner had significantly worse grief intensity, psychiatric symptomatology, loneliness, and worse social support. So we're starting to see some really interesting data. Please don't tweet that. This is work in progress. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, and then the last thing which is really exciting, building on the bereavement work with Steve Marshall, who's transitioning into a, a clinical academic career with me. The SKIP study, again, supported by Marie Curie. Uh, we're collecting primary data with children who are facing bereavement here in London to inform resources to support those children as they approach bereavement and into their bereavement. An Access C communication is going on now, and that's happening with Debbie Baybrooks working on that. 
and we're developing evidence-based communication guidance. So that grant that I wasn't sure would gain traction has now led on to a number of awards and a huge amount of uh, impact, so I'm very excited. And it's also allowed us to partner with Jenny Hunt in Zimbabwe, some data we published uh, last year in BMJ Global Health, looking at key populations in three Zimbabwean towns. And here is some data from a sex worker we interviewed they say we are doing something illegal, which is prostitution. So you won't get the medication. So they won't give it you the medication when they have it. And this has led on to a really interesting part of our NIHR award, looking at person-centred care and working with global health and social medicine to really understand what values-based practice means and how a healthcare professional's values might actually prevent access to care for those who need it. And we have uh, Tom Bolelo Croco now working in Bulawayo to uh, expand that as an Amari Fellow under the, the Welcome Programme. So, capacity building. I think if I could kind of reflect on the, the, the most enjoyable bit of having uh, been a professor for a year now is the ability at this stage in my career to really capacity build. I've been capacity built to get to this stage and now it's really exciting the opportunities that I have to do that and I'd like to talk through a few examples of capacity building here in the Cicely Saunders Institute and, and my programme to date. So a couple of years ago, we got uh, with the University of Brussels a Marie Curie initial training network. Now, these are really exciting. You take early career researchers who show great promise. We had 17 of them from across Europe. They get to have funding to, to complete a PhD, also to have a training programme on things like cross-national research, ethics, uh, how to publish. They all had to produce three papers, and within that time, they also transfer for a three-month period to another European university. And an enormous amount of uh, evidence came out of this programme, and these early career researchers that, are, that Irene and I mentored, amongst others, are now moving on in their careers. And, and a few little snapshots from that data, a study showing that uh, of nursing home residents dying with dementia, a third of the families were unaware of that diagnosis. So they're dying with dementia, the families had not been told. And actually the, uh, the likelihood of knowing that reduces the longer uh, onset after entering the nursing home. So if you enter with dementia, you're more likely, the family's more likely to know. But if the dementia develops when you're in that nursing home, the family are less likely to know about it. And we also did a large population-based study of people who have died of cancer and their, their decedents in the UK and looking at the quality of care, we were able to show perceived quality of care by the, uh, by the bereaved family member was lowest for GPs and then for community nurses, but highest for specialist palliative care. So that's the last three months of life, perceived quality of end of life care. However, GP satisfaction did increase the adjusted odds ratio of about uh, 2.5, that should say. Uh, and then for hospital death, actually, if you died at hospital at the end of life, it actually reduced the satisfaction with GP care. So the capacity building that uh, I've been able to do within the Institute, I think, really serves the King's College London vision for 2029, which is to make the world a better place. And I think as an Institute, that really <laughs> mirrors what we're trying to do in our mission, which, of course, is cutting-edge research, skilled multi-professional care, and innovation in engagement and education. And an example of that is the Global Care Programme, funded by um, the Atlantic Philanthropies, we created a network of clinical and academic fellows across the UK, USA, Ireland, Nepal and Vietnam and I led on the, the Vietnamese bit. And very excitingly, we were on holiday in Vietnam a few weeks ago, so I went to see the, uh, the medical school where I asked for a commitment that at the end of this fellowship there would be growth of an academic uh, clinical department and they were absolutely delighted to show me around and now it's the first palliative care academic clinical department within the region as a direct result, which is enormously exciting. Also, um, Huyen, one of our other fellows, has now opened the first paediatric palliative care service in Vietnam as a direct result of the fellowship she spent here with us. So these are really exciting impacts. Build Care Africa, I think, has also had enormous impact. Um, this is building on our Sir Halley Stewart scholarships who uh, kindly supported African uh, palliative care budding researchers and clinicians to come spend a year with us and gain their MSc. And now as part of Build Care Africa, we have, of course, Eve Namisango, who's here doing her PhD. And now we have a peer-mentored research network. We have the African Research Seminar, which I'm delighted to say is now entirely led by my African colleagues, which is fantastic. 
And also we've got a number of really exciting research projects happening under this mentorship programme. So Barbara Mutedzi has just closed recruitment on her feasibility trial of a lay community bereavement intervention in Zimbabwe. Uh, Jonathan Bayuo in Ghana is developing evidence-based clinical guidelines for end-of-life care for people with severe burns because that's often a cause of death within sub-Saharan Africa. Andrew Olagonju in Nigeria is recruiting to a cohort of uh, renal patients. And very well aligned to our funders, I think, to the Dunhill Medical Trust, we have Nassau Bayinza working with me to run an RCT of a palliative care intervention for people with TB. So I think there's a nice link back to our funding there. We also, I'm delighted to say, under the Global Challenges Research Fund and now working with the Global Cancer Policy and the War Studies team, working with Ping, my, my postdoc, leading a partnership with Turkey and Jordan to develop better palliative and end-of-life care for refugees and displaced people in the Middle East, which has been quite challenging and exciting at the same time, and we're trying to understand what additional outcome matter to people who may be refugees and displaced people and what that means at the end of life and to improve the quality of that care. And some data has literally just come in, in the last few weeks. Here's data from two women with advanced breast cancer in Jordan, both of whom are Syrian refugees. One says, my mentality is ruined, my body is ruined. I wish someone would support us, but there isn't any. Who would I talk to? There's nobody. I wish we would return to our country. I don't know if we ever will. Another woman says, it's life and the hardships we're facing make me worried and upset. In Syria, we always, had visit, we always visited neighbours. In Syria, if someone had an illness that serious, they wouldn't leave her alone. So I think the big questions for us is what it means facing the end of life when you've had prior trauma, how advanced cancer compounds that trauma, but also how you achieve good end of life care for people whose social networks are fractured. Also absolutely delighted that we're part of ASSET, another Global Challenges Research funded project through the NIHR, and I'm leading the uh, integrated primary health care and also the person-centred care programmes. So we're looking at improved management of COPD within primary care, which is very exciting because the management of breathlessness has been a major theme within this institute. So we're really excited to be able to, to broaden that out to a large cluster trial of COPD management in primary care and also strengthening of palliative care in TB management. And a cross-cutting theme that's been funded through this that I'm leading is what person-centred care really means, because I think it's interesting right now it's uh, a term you can find very easily in the literature and in guidance. We must be person-centred, but very little evidence to underpin that theory and appraise what that really means from the patient's perspective across conditions. So that's a really exciting theme of work we have now. And looking forward, 2019 is an exciting year for uh, launch of new projects. So with Steve, we'll be launching the Skip Childhood Bereavement Project, but also another project here in the UK, understanding out-of-hours care, because out-of-hours care is really, really important for patients and families living in the community at the end of life. But there's very little understanding of what the typology of those models are, and also the uh, availability of different components of care, and also how we think they improve outcomes. So we're trying to understand those models of care and also understand what the perceived mechanisms of action and uh, improved outcomes are for receiving good out-of-hours care. Once we've done that work, then we'll be able to much better evaluate that care and also improve it. Uh, also, a study we're launching here in, uh, in the UK, uh, particularly working with uh, Belfast University, a new European grant that we'll be launching uh, after Christmas, Diadic, which is a five European country randomised control trial of a psychoeducational intervention for family caregivers and advanced cancer. And we'll be looking at uh, online versions of that and how effective that is. Through the National Institutes of Health with the University of California, San Francisco, starting in February, we're going to be building on their stigma program, because they've been doing lots of work on stigma and HIV, taking that now into the Cancer and Advanced Disease uh, Forum and understanding what that might mean. Very exciting, and please don't tweet this, and uh, I can't say too much, but uh, Liz Sampson from UCL and Catherine Evans from here in the department I'll be working with, and they will be making an announcement very soon. I'm delighted that we've got a major program grant award about to, uh, to happen, looking at person-centred end-of-life care for people with dementia here in the UK. But uh, you'll be hearing from them very soon about what we're going to be doing. And lastly, just launching now a very exciting uh, new development in our outcome measurement work, looking at digital technologies, so enabling patients to real-time report their outcomes and their symptoms and concerns 
to uh, the healthcare providers and working out the best systems for that data management. And we're looking forward to this really being an exciting stream of research in the coming years. Just wanted to finish on this slide. Um, first of all, I want to thank again the Dunhill Medical Trust for enabling me to be here today and to have a vision for the future. It's very, very exciting. Uh, those of you that work within UK universities will have heard of Athena Swan, which is a, a national universities programme to promote opportunities and achievement of women in science. So when I look back at my career, um, it's because of women in science that I've been able to be here today because I have been mentored and supported by some incredible female academics who've given me opportunities. So Professor Julie Dockrell from UCL, Professor Susan Gollenbott from Cambridge University, Professor Lorraine Scher from UCL, and of course, Professor Irene Higginson from King's, who for 20 years has done such a skilled job in creating opportunity and mentoring and building us all to be the best that we can be. And I'm very, very grateful for that. Um, also, in terms of Athena Swan in creating opportunities and enabling us to identify talent and develop it, of course, fitting parenting within that. So within the period of my time here at King's, Jason and I have adopted two children and uh, I've been able to advance my career while us taking on the kids and I'm very grateful, of course, to uh, Jason and Mum who pick up the childcare while I'm travelling. So thank you very much for that. And also these logos I'm very proud of at the bottom as a faculty. We are proud of our promotion of equality of opportunity, finding diversity and talent and over 20 years in this institute, I've seen that diversity grow and the ability to find talent and nurture it. So these are not empty, uh, empty logos here. They really mean something. As an institute, I think they're important. I come from a family of very humble means. Uh, further and higher education didn't mean anything. So for me to be here at a prestigious institution like King's, where talent is nurtured, is uh, incredibly important. So thank you very much to Irene and thank you to Dunhill Medical Trust. Thank you.